Show with your host, Lance McCann. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Hello, I am Lance McCann, and this is the Lance McCann Show, brought to you by SellYourHomeStockton.com. I'm a local real estate professional with Keller Williams. My license number is 0198-7449. I would like to extend any an invitation out to anybody who is running against our current guest. Uh, it's an open forum, so I'd love to have you on. And I'm with Pat Withrow. He's running for county sheriff. Thank you for uh, coming on to my show, Pat. Absolutely. Thank you for the invite. How you doing? I'm doing well. Let's get into this. Uh, so when you're, I'm trying to figure out what made you want to become a, a police officer. When you were a kid, did you play cops and robbers, and were you always the, the, the cop? <laughs> Let's take it way back. Yeah, well, yeah, we obviously we played around a lot like that, and uh, cops and robbers, or cowboys and Indians, or mm -hmm. whatever it was at the time. Yeah, and keep it PC now. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And uh, um, so, uh, I don't know if I was always a good guy, but uh, um, learned playing both sides of it, I'm sure. And uh, just always enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed TV shows like that back in my days. It was mm -hmm. like the, the Rookies or Adam 12 and things like that. I enjoyed those shows and, and uh, thought someday I might like to do that. But, uh, you know, when you're going to school, you kind of start focusing on business and money and things mm -hmm. like that. And I uh, didn't think uh, um, that uh, I'd uh, make enough money or being a cop or anything like that. So I, I started in business, you know, right okay. out of college. And, and, uh, uh, but then eventually I said, hey, I'm going to do something I love more than something I'm not enjoying. And, and uh, eventually went back and, and went to the academy. Oh, wow. How long ago was that? Well, that was, uh, <laughs> in uh, 1987, I went to the academy. Okay. So, well, 30 years ago. So. And did you start in the sheriff's department or did you start, where, where did you? Where I did. You I was actually, I was working uh, for a company called Lumberjack. You may remember they were like the oh, Home yeah. Depot of the day. I do. And I had been transferred from our Bakersfield store back up here to Stockton and uh, uh, just wasn't enjoying it. I enjoyed the side where we were chasing people out of the store all the time doing shoplifting or, or we would hide in the yard at night and catching them climbing the fence but uh, I enjoyed that side of it and it just so happened that uh, one of the guys that worked for me in, in, in uh, uh, one of our places there in Lumberjack, his dad was a assistant sheriff at the time and he told me that he was going to apply and that they're looking for, for people so I, I decided to put my application in and they hired me and sent me to the academy up in Butte by Chico. Oh nice. That's uh a little bit ago up there. The law enforcement has changed quite a bit since since then. Oh, oh, imagine. oh yeah, yeah. My academy up there. First of all, it was great. I was 25 year old, young guy, single, and and uh, invincible. Uh, yeah, living at a, a Holiday Inn up in Chico. So that wasn't so bad going to the academy there. But it was only 16 weeks long then, and now it's all the way up to 26 weeks wow. long. So a lot more information they've got to take in. So did you get into law enforcement because? family history, um, what was your passion about law enforcement? Yeah, you know, I am the first officer in, uh, in our family, and uh, although I did have a, a great-grandfather who was a sheriff down by uh, Madera, Fresno area that I used to hear stories about from my grandpa, but um, so I'm the first uh, uh, in modern time for us to be in law enforcement, but I was raised, uh, my family was very um, uh, proactive in, in civil rights and things like that. So I was brought up with a passion as a as an Irish Catholic boy during the Kennedy years that that you paid back to your community and you, and you treated people right and you, you took care of those who couldn't take care of themselves. And that's the way I was raised. My my mom and dad. I was blessed with with great parents. And uh, I lost my dad when I was 25, um, just out, out of the academy. But uh, um, they instilled this, that uh, you give back to your community and you protect people who can't protect themselves. And, and so that was kind of my passion. I see. I, I, think we, I think a lot of people have seen a social shift of that where a lot of people, well, maybe it's just because I'm more involved in the community, I'm seeing um, a lot of people starting to take care of other people, not rely so much on government involvement, but actually community involvement reaching out to people and, and helping them get get a hand up instead of a hand out. Yeah, I really, I, I agree with you on that. I really think in, in politics nowadays, it's becoming so divisive, no matter what side of the fence you're on, mm -hmm. and uh, um, that people are seeing that they really need to get personally involved, and, and uh, uh, if they're passionate about their community and, 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 and helping their, their neighbors and help protecting their neighbors, because they know now, you know, cops can't be everywhere. Right. And, uh, 
it's all about uh, reaching out and helping each other and, and getting involved in, in, in organizations. And there's so many great organizations out there, nonprofits and things mm -hmm. like that, that, that you can in, invest your time in and, and, uh, and really make a difference in your community. So what brought you to Stockton? To, I mean, what was the... Stockton's very unique. We're centrally located. We're um, an hour or so from the Bay Area. We're a couple hours from the Sierras. Yeah, two hours away from the ocean. So, what was it about Stockton that, that brought you here? Well, I was born in Modesto, so uh, I was close by, and uh, Stockton uh, was always kind of that uh, that big scary place up there for us in Modesto. <laughs> right. uh, but, uh, uh, we would come up here for you know in high school and stuff like that for, to go out to dinner for Christmas dance or prom mm -hmm. or something like that. But uh, um, you know, I, I, I didn't have any uh, inkling that I was going to move up this way, but when I started working for Lumberjack while I was at uh, Modesto Junior College, uh, they hired me in their management program, uh, and uh, they transferred me down to Bakersfield, and I was down there for a year or so, and then I was promoted and got sent to the Stockton store. So it was close to home, uh, uh, where my family still is in Modesto, and uh, uh, so that's how I ended up in Stockton itself, and then, as I said earlier, uh, uh, it, it was just a... Uh, uh, God reaching down and, and, and putting uh, Bill Thomas in front of me <laughs> with his dad as assistant sheriff, and and uh, um, that's how I ended up working at the sheriff's office here. Right. Stockton's kind of like a black hole. It's just kind of you get here and you, you you're stuck here. Something something's great about Stockton, and I see Stockton shifting from where it was a few years ago. People are becoming more aware of what's going on politically in, in the neighborhoods and, and trying to make a shift. So my question to you is, because you're running for sheriff, what was your moment? What, I mean, what gave you the idea, like, you know what, I need to do something? What was that moment, and what did that look like to you? Well, you know, I, I was in the sheriff's office for 28 years, you know, and I, I, I had a great career there. I got to work patrol for a regular patrol. I started out in the old jail. They had the big old jail out there, and, and uh, then I got transferred to the street and got to work the regular streets for about three years, all the different areas, and then I became a canine officer, and I uh, got to do that for 12 years, which I thought was a, a fantastic job, and I eventually took over the train. You with your best friend, right? Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had two canine, two different canine partners, and they were great. and. Uh, um, so I got to work all the different beats with that, and then I was on SWAT for five years, and, and uh, I got to street crimes units and DEA drug task force. I got to work our, our, our city of Lathrop, which is our contract city. So I got to do all these different things in the sheriff's office. So you're pretty well-rounded. Yeah, yeah, I, I was very blessed. I got to do just about everything. And, uh, um, but then um, the current sheriff uh, ran for election, and um, none of us supported him. Uh, every time he's run, none of his... Uh, his rank and file staff have, have endorsed him or supported him, uh, but he wins, and uh, um, that's why we need uh, you know to to get involved and, and show up to vote if you're not happy with the way things are. But uh, um, I was a, a vocal critic at that time, and um, we can see how under his 12 years how the department has changed and and how our our our, our, our county seat here has become number six in the nation in violent crime, and uh, it's not getting any safer out there, and we've got all this. Uh, uh, corruption and mistrust going on at our department now and and so I I was one of those guys who was complaining and and finally I said if I'm gonna complain about it I better be willing to get involved so it was never my goal to to run for sheriff but uh, I sat down with my wife and my kids and said hey this is what I'm thinking about doing and uh, so back in about go, you're crazy oh absolutely <laughs> absolutely we knew nothing about politics and he was he was he was like a tick dug in and, and uh, um, but I said, hey, I, I, at least I've got to try. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I would say to, to any of the citizens out there that, that, that uh, feel uh, disappointed or unhappy with the way our community is, then you've got to get involved. And uh, even if, you, if you, the outcome doesn't turn out like you, like you planned, at least if you tried, you know, you You're can bring right awareness to the situation. We have a couple, uh, you know, we have some, some big changes and good candidates running against the incumbents right now, I believe. Um, we need a change. Stockton is going to, in my opinion, it's shifting. It's either going to shift up for the better or it's going to continue to go down. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, uh, the old saying, the definition of insanity is 
keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Well, mm -hmm. uh, that's where we all have to get involved, and you know we have to you know, we have to make it like politics used to be. We we all took took our turn uh, going out and, and and serving in politics and representing our neighbors, and then you'd come back and somebody else would step up. So. These long-term politicians, they get in there and they forget why they really went in there and what their purpose and their cause is. That's a very good point. You get kind of sucked up, I think, or stuck in the limelight of being that persona or that person, and you kind of lose, you have the ability to lose touch with the original reason of why you went in. Yeah, yeah you start to believe your own press. So uh, um, that's why I think it's good that, that every now and then we... We rotate people in and out. We get new ideas. We get fresh eyes on it, and uh, um, and uh, you try and make the changes that you can. And then what you need to really do is train the people around you so that when they're ready to step up, that they do an even better job than you did. That's a very good point. You must learn that in the academy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just uh, just life lessons, and, and you know it means so much in law enforcement because. You know, our lives depend on the guy standing next to us, just like in the military and many right. other things are in the fire department. And, and uh, um, so you want to make sure that you're imparting all the knowledge you can on young people that are coming into the department or working with you and, and uh, so that, that not only do they stay safe, but, but they keep their partners as safe. So. Right. That's the, uh, the important thing. Uh, one of the questions that somebody wanted me to ask you is concealed carry permits. What is your, what is your view on... Concealed carry permits. Yeah, uh, concealed weapon permits, CCWs as they're called, you know, that's always been a strong part of my platform. Last time when I ran in 2014, uh, the sheriff was not handing out CCWs. He was against it. And uh, uh, because we came out very strong in it, right towards the end of the election, he flipped and he said, okay, I'll start issuing them. And uh, um, he now uh, allows you to fill out your application and he takes your money, but I mean, people are waiting years to get. Uh, whether told whether they're going to get their CCW or not. And, and I'm a firm believer, look, I do not want our public to have to be armed and, and walk around and worry about that because it's a huge responsibility. It's, it's a huge liability. But God bless somebody who's willing to take on that responsibility and stand up and protect their neighbors until law enforcement gets there. So I'm a firm believer that if somebody is a good person and doesn't have anything precluding them from having a CCW, they have the right to protect themselves and their family and their neighbors, and and I'm not going to stand in the way of that. I wel welcome that. I want them to be well trained. I want them to be understand the liability. Having been in multiple shootings myself, I know how how uh, chaotic they can be and how dangerous they can be. And once that bullet leaves the gun, it's not coming back. Yeah, it's life changing. Absolutely. I mean, to, I mean at, from a citizen's perspective, um, if I was to ever carry a weapon and have to it in a situation no matter justified or unjustified it's going to change your life it's Absolutely. something you have to live with for the rest of your life yeah it's not like the movies it's it's not like that at all i mean there is there is a, a physical and emotional baggage that you carry with you uh, with you the rest of your life it impacts everyone around you your mm -hmm. family and friends and uh, so the best thing always is just be a good witness you know stay safe uh, if something bad is happening, be a good witness, wait for law enforcement to get there. Uh, but if it comes down to that point um, that uh, life is in danger um, and you have to make that choice, then I want to make sure that, that you're ready and have the skills that you need to be able to make a good choice and to do what you need to do to protect yourself and others until we can get there and help you. There's a lot of organizations out there that train people for those situations. Um, so I would imagine that would be one of your requirements is to... Oh, yes. By, by law, you have to go through the training and, and <laughs> things like that to be able to get a CCW, and, and there's ongoing training. But I'd like to take it a step further. It's always nice to have um, law enforcement involved. I'd like my guys to be there. And, and we, have, we have equipment out there like the fax machine, and, and that's a, a computer-generated uh, program where you can stand in front of it and you get in shoot-don't-shoot shoot situations and things oh. like that. And, so it's a uh, simulator. Absolutely. And it's, you know, uh, uh, shooting is a perishable skill. You know, the Navy mm -hmm. SEALs say that for every one day you don't shoot, you lose 1%. And, and so if you, you think about a guy who, who goes out and shoots every six months, you know, he, he's losing about 50% of his skills there. So, um, and, and, you know, think about law enforcement who train all the time. Wow. We miss about 80% of the time when we shoot. Oh, wow. So it, it's really different when adrenaline hits and all that type of thing. So our goal is that you never have to use it, 
right. um, and that you never have to be in that situation. But if you are, I, I want you to have a, a fighting chance. And if my, my family's out in a restaurant and a store and some bad guy's going to hurt them, I pray to God there's a good citizen there who's willing to stand up and help protect them. So touching on, on that, is there any statistics on people just drawing a weapon and ending the confrontation? Is there any good stats on that? You know, I don't, I'm not aware of any. I'm sure there are. You know, there are people who are very um, uh, educated on, on all those type of stats mm -hmm. and, and on both sides of that political fence, actually. Uh, I'm sure you're going to hear uh, uh, stats both ways, but um, you know the only time that weapon should ever be be drawn, it, it's not to try and intimidate or scare somebody or something like that. It's it's deadly force is warranted. So um, um, you need to make sure that uh, um, before you, uh, you you draw that smoke wagon, as they said in the movie, <laughs> um, you uh, you better be willing to uh, to use it. One of our viewers is asking, do you believe in change of school safety absolutely I mean uh, school safety is a huge priority right now in San Joaquin County uh, from the sheriff's office we only have four school resource officers and I think that's absolutely terrible for, for several reasons not just for school safety but we need to get back in our schools we need to mm -hmm. engage with our children and let them know cops just aren't around when bad things happen right we are here to serve the public that's the the most important side that, that, that we forget sometimes is that we're here for service and help no matter what your issue is. We're kind of the tip of the spear. I remember as a kid there was always, uh, not always, but you would see a cop there you know, every couple days and he would engage with the kids and walk around the playground and, and talk with people. So I, I think it shifts the perception of them growing up where cops only, you know, they only do bad things. So right. There's tons of cops out there who do good things for people, Absolutely. For, for bad people all the time. Yeah, you know, you never hear about that. Stockton has a great uh, school resource program. SUSD is amazing. They're the police of our schools and in there all the time. And we need to engage with these these departments. You know, that's why I've had the endorsement of Stockton PD and Tracy PD and Lodi PD because they want us to help them engage in these things. And and school safety is a huge part of that. And the more we're on the campuses during school, after school programs, all types of things like that, and the more eyes we have out there protecting our kids. You know, bad guys are basically lazy, and mm -hmm. they're going to go where it's easy to get away with things, and where right. where 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 people can be victimized without consequences right. for them. So if they know that they come to San Joaquin County, anywhere in San Joaquin County, whether it's in the cities or the counties, and that if they try and harm our citizens, that they're going to be challenged, and we're going to fight back. Well, then they'll choose to go somewhere else because right. they're cowards. They don't want to take that on. So yes, there's other programs we can do. Uh, lots of things we can talk about. I do not believe teachers should be armed. Uh, as I said, that's, uh, they've got a hard enough job as far as right. dealing with students. Uh, they shouldn't have this added stress of, of, of having a firearm that they would need to do. Just let them do what they do, and then we will get more people on campus. We could, we could ask officers who have retired to come back as per diems and, and just be in plain clothes and hang out with the kids and, again, get to know the officers as human beings and yet be another set of eyes on the school to notice when things are strange or to... The, the big goal is to stop it before it happens. Right. Because once the bullets are already flying, people are dying. Or, so. or, or maybe connecting with that kid who is being bullied exactly. and, and so on. And, so and that's, reaching out to them before he gets to the point where he's like, screw it. Right. Um, so that's why we want trained professionals, I think, with, you know, like retired officers or things like that, that notice that change of behavior in a kid. Start, he starts to become the mm -hmm. loner or whatever like that, he or she. And uh, um, then, then they go out and they reach out and they start to do that intervention to find out what's going on, something wrong at home, something wrong here at school, right. and stop it before it happens. I agree. I agree. Um, so what, what changes do you plan on if you're elected? What, are, what things do you are number one, top five in your book of things you want to do? I'm sure there's numerous. But yeah. What would you like to see happen? in Stockton. Well, they, they, you only know what you county. know. Yeah, you only know what you know at this point. Uh, but we, we've all seen the newspapers and see all the things that are going on in our department. So uh, uh, some of the things that I want to do is I want to start with restaffing a regular patrol. We've got uh, 124 positions allotted by the Board of Supervisors and we only have about 67 guys out rolling on the streets and regular patrol, the restaurant specialized units. 
and uh, I think we that's part of school safety also if we if we fill up all our all our beats and with all the officers we should have out there handling routine calls for service mm -hmm. then instead of just answering calls for service now we're able to be proactive and get out of right. our cars and get to know our neighbors and get to be in our schools so we need to restaff that and I'm not talking about hiring a ton more people we already have those bodies we just need to use them properly shift uh, their their uh their primary mission. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the second thing we need to do is secure that jail. Since this uh, current sheriff's been in office, we've had 337 escapes, which is the most in the nation, and uh, wow. that's unacceptable. If somebody's going to victimize our citizens, there should be a price to pay for that. And um, so we want to make sure that we secure that jail out there. Uh, I know every time that this sheriff has run, he says he's going to build a new jail, and he's never built it. He's saying it again this time. We don't need to build a new jail. We have plenty of beds out there. If we're going to build anything, we need to build uh, a program out there where we can have apprentices and start training people who are in custody. I was just going to say, like, give them a lot of those guys and gals lack life skills. They Absolutely. Lack the ability to earn, so they figure out other ways to earn. Absolutely. So building life skills and giving them an opportunity to go out back into the workforce and say, hey, I have a certificate, I'm a diesel mechanic, I screwed up back here, but I, I'm trying to straighten my life out, or, or construction skills, some type of life skills, teaching them how to balance a checkbook. Absolutely. The, tra the trades are looking for so many people. We have a manpower shortage of men and women for all these jobs that we want to do around here. And uh, um, so we have that captive audience. Let's give them the option not to go back down that path of crime again. And it's a win-win. Then we've got a productive citizen back paying their taxes. And it's just this cycle that stops this recidivism and them coming back. And it's much cheaper to train them once they're in there than to house them in that place. So we want to secure that jail. So what is our recidivism is when people go back to jail Absolutely. a second or third or fourth time. So right. do, what is the current stats? I don't have the, 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 the current rate on it. I know it's huge um, that that people just keep coming back because they don't have any other option. You know? right. and they just keep stealing or yeah. keep committing small. And if we can help people get clean and sober and, and or give them uh, job skills, whether I think, it's... I think when they have a purpose, it's easier to stay clean and sober. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, there are so many state or local organizations that want to help or nonprofits and, and all the tools are there to help these folks. We just need to put it all together. Mm -hmm. I uh, mean, there's tons of nonprofits um, that we could all partner together and make a difference. Oh yeah, definitely, absolutely. So then the other thing we had to do is what we just saw, the Board of Supervisors uh, hired an independent investigation into the coroner's division and what they found was just uh, shocking. It was atrocious and, and uh, so they voted to take the coroner's division to strip the sheriff of the coroner's division that we've had since 1850. And I think it was a great decision on their part. At this point, we need to make sure that um, we have a separate medical examiner's office who uh, do these investigations, especially in officer-involved incidents, and so that the public feels secure when a uh, finding of, of, of one of our loved one's deaths comes out, that they're confident that it was, it was uh, founded just on the facts of the case. Right. And then when it's officer-involved incident, then those facts are combined with the investigation that our, that our DA and the other police agencies do to find out whether if it's a death, there's, it was justifiable or not, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've been, I have a unique perspective of this because I've been on both sides of this. Um, you know, I've been uh, uh, the guy who's the coroner out on the street and investigating deaths, and I've been the officer who's involved in the shootings and, and being investigated. And the only thing that we as officers ever want is to be judged on the facts of the case and uh, be held to uh, the standard that um, we tried to do what was best. And, and uh, um, as long as we're judged on the facts of what we did, we're okay with that. You know, we strap right. on a vest and a gun every day, and we know that we can do something that impacts our, our lives. Yeah. You know, it's, but the moment we get politicians involved who start trying to change the results, trying to, you know, they're worried about whether they're going to get votes, or worried if this is going to impact uh, their, uh, uh, them getting reelected, uh, then, then we, we lose the, the, the trust of the public, and we must maintain the trust of the public. They must know they're going to get a fair, honest, um, uh, result from an investigation. And, and we have to be transparent about it. We have to show those videos that we have. Right now, the Sheriff's Office still, nowadays, does not have body cameras. 
and and uh, um, they're in the testing and evaluation stage. Well, he's going to stay in that testing and evaluation stage as long as he's in office because he doesn't want any type of negative publicity. Right. You know, so no, we need Stock to. Stockton PD the, has body cams. Yes, they do, and and we saw it in, in the in the controversy that's going on right now. They got uh, knocked off apparently, and it's tough when you're in a fight and you're fighting for your life, and somebody's under the influence and. And unless you've experienced that, you don't know how quickly these things can go right. sideways. But uh, um, at least they have the cameras, and, and, and they're trying their best to be transparent. And, and uh, um, you know, maybe somebody will come up with a, a uniform where the camera is uh, sewn into the, uh, the uh, uniform itself, you know, and then we just plug in our shirt, you know, or right. whatever. And uh, um, whatever it takes, but um, I was the first one ever at the Sheriff's Department to put cameras in our cars. They're still there today down in Lathrop. We do not have them in our patrol cars here. The Sheriff refused to. But back then, 15 years ago, the officers agreed with me that we don't mind having the cameras in the car. We want people to see what we do. And 99.9% .9 of the time... That we're, as we're risking our life to protect yeah, you. Yeah, and, and that we're trying to do the right thing. And if we make a mistake, then we should admit it. You right. know, if I speak to somebody inappropriately and lose my temper or whatever, I, I should admit it. And there should be a price to pay for that. But as long as we're trying to do the right thing and being honest about it, I think the public will stand by us. Mm -hmm. I agree. What do you... Uh, What's your opinion about the homeless situation? Somebody was asking. Yeah, that's that's a huge problem here locally, and I, I want to do. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here. You know, we have some programs right now that people are trying to help with the homeless, and this has been going on for years. But I, I like what Sacramento does. They have a, a, a homeless intervention team. They have officers on it. They have uh, people from county ordinances uh, or, or city ordinances, and. Um, uh, they have uh, mental health professionals, they have uh, drug counselors, and everybody goes into it as a team. We, we're not reactive, we're being proactive, right. going into these homeless camps and finding out and triaging people, finding out how they ended up in this situation, and you start triaging to find out how we can help them get out of this. So instead of just pushing them on and making it somebody else's problem. Despite their perception, not everybody that's homeless is a drug addict. Exactly. Uh, but some of them are, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's a, an issue we'll deal with. We have we have homeless veterans. The, there's a huge problem growing nowadays most people don't know about in female homeless veterans out on the street. And so, and then we have some, there's a very small percentage that want to live that lifestyle. Yeah. And that's where, you know, law enforcement comes in and we enforce our cords, uh, codes and ordinances and local laws and make sure that they know this isn't the place that's going to happen. But anybody that wants help or needs help, then we need to go out there and, and, and try and help them. I work with Catholic Charities and there's a, uh, it's called HUD Bash. It's a housing program for veterans, um, male and female. So, and then there's a new, Anchor Village, it's a new building that's being built to help um, transitional housing for veterans. So nice. Things are starting to happen for the veterans. Right. Our current sheriff, he's, 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 he's ignored this problem for years, and finally uh, he said, oh, well, I'll, I'll let 60 of these homeless guys live at the, at the, at the jail out there in and, and, and some of the barracks. So he cleared out all the inmates from the barracks, and he's going to let these homeless guys live there while they get some training, and they're just a matter of feet away from the other inmates who are in custody. And the correctional officers are, are, are just scared to death by this because you can imagine the drugs and contraband that's going to be thrown oh, yeah. over the little five foot chain link fence yeah, yeah. to the other inmates and how that's going to put them at danger so it's just a political move that that you know we have so many other buildings that we could use here locally i know the the ymca right down here is, oh, yeah. is vacant the old one and i'm sure it needs some work but you know there's there's places like that that we can be doing that they should not be in our jail i agree I don't know if I'm supposed to agree, but I, <laughs> I mean, it's just common sense. Yes. Um, somebody said that they're going to do something with the Greyhound bus station. They won't, they're going to put homeless people in there. Is that something that you're aware of? Uh, I, I, you know, they, I've heard several things that wants to be done with the old Greyhound bus station. Uh, I know the one thing we can't do is pick up homeless people and put them on the bus and send them someplace else to make them somebody else's problem. But that's what I, I've heard of this. I don't know if it, you may have an answer is that other cities do that. They a ship lot, a lot of their homeless to Stockton. You know, I've heard that also. Uh, I know we have a lot of people showing up here. Um, well, I've not seen that with my own eyes, but it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, you know, that's a that's a, an easy temporary solution to a problem that we should be trying to fix. 
Um, I don't know what they're going to do with that building. Um, Here's a forty dollar bus ticket and forty dollars. Yeah, have a great day. Yeah, exactly. You'll see Stockton. They'll yeah. take care of you. It comes somebody else's problem. Well, we're not going to do that here. We're all going to work together, and we're going to try and help these folks get out of this situation. And uh, however they want to use that building, if it's for uh, transitional housing or anything like that, obviously we can use a, a lot of that, mm -hmm. and that would be fantastic. So. Um, you know, that will be up to the city, but uh, anything like that to try and help, I think, is great. I agree. I mean, there's a, to me, Stockton is such a great place to live. We just have all these little problems that are plaguing us right now. And if we just get over the hurdle, right. I mean, I don't know why Stockton can't be a huge metropolitan city. It we, should be. You're absolutely right. It's this jewel that sits right here in the middle of, of California. And, and as you said, businesses should want to come here, but they don't, and then they won't until we get our crime under control. The, uh, think about it. We have an airport. Right. We have an intermodal train station right off of Charter Way. Right. We have Interstate I-5 and 99. Right. And we have one of the largest inland ports in the nation. Absolutely. Why can't this place be booming with business? It should be, and it will be. Once we turn the crime problem around, all with, all people ever hear about Stockton is negative, you know, unfortunately. And we're going to turn that around. Come June 5th, and that's when my election is and when it's over, um, we're going to engage with all the other law enforcement agencies, and we're going to work together. We're going to throw a net over San Joaquin County and help people and make people safe, and we're going to be very tough on crime. So you're, you're going to work in conjunction with Stockton PD and the Sheriff's Department to try to... Oh, I've, I've seen them... I have an apartment building downtown. I've seen them kind of the Sheriff's patrolling to help or leave. So what is your... Speak a little bit on, on your plan with the PD and the Sheriff's Department. Well, I think it's telling when uh, Stockton PD interviewed me to see whether they wanted to support my campaign or not. The first question that came out of their mouth is, hey, what's happened to the Sheriff's Office? Where did they go? And I said, well, you guys are in a war and we've become Switzerland because if you can engage in a war, you can get bad press. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to get back in the fight and, and we're going to work alongside with Chief Jones and we're going to share resources and we're going to get back involved in, in, in joint task force and, 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 and being very proactive in going after criminals. And we're also going to join with them in being very proactive in helping people. And anybody, we're going to offer that olive branch and say, hey, if you want out of this life of gang and drugs and crime, we are here to help. We will do whatever it takes to make sure that you can get out of this. But we are also going to have those arrows in our other hand that yeah. says if you're going to victimize our citizens and if you're going to uh, point guns at our officers or our citizens, well, we're going to be there to stop you. And, and so uh, we need to be aggressive on both fronts to make a difference. And I think more people are going to want out of that life of crime and want that help then we're going to have to hammer. And that's why we don't need to build a new jail. That's, that's old style thinking. That's just going backwards. I like what you're saying about teaching the these inmates life skills. They're stuck there for a year or two years. You might as well give them a life skill, a trade, electrician, uh, carpentry, something auto body. And yeah. Something to go earn an honest living. Absolutely. We uh, used to have those and they were eliminated under the sheriff. We used to have an auto body shop, an upholstery shop, small engine repair. They even tried fiber optic cable stuff which I wasn't a big fan. I didn't want them working on my uh, alarm <laughs> system. But uh, um, no, the trades would really love to have these well-trained guys or at least to start their training and, and they can come out and continue it and, and get good benefits and good pay. Because you never know when you're going to change somebody's life. I was downtown with uh, uh, Mr. Murchison. He was the principal at uh, Stag, and he was a real estate agent. I was looking at a building and I ran into this guy, and he was out there selling crack. He, you know, I'm like, what are you doing out here? You know, he was like, hire me. I'm like, <laughs> why? Mm -hmm. You know, it was my first thing. And, then, and he's like, well, I want to learn what you do. And I'm like, well, I don't know you. And if you, if, if you steal my tools, then that's my life. Then I have to start over. Right. And he's like, well, how much are your tools? I'm like, probably like $1,500, $2,000. He goes, I'll give you that right now. And I'm like... Wow, I go, how about this? Here's my card, call me, and we'll go have lunch. We'll start there. Mm -hmm. And so I, I look for him downtown all the time. He was right across the street from Mariani's, and I ran into him five years later on a fluke. And I was walking in, in and out, and I looked at this guy, big six foot brother, and I'm like, is your name Fred? And he's looking at me like, 
who the heck are you, you know? And uh, he goes, Lance, you know, I met you downtown years ago. And he's like, oh man, he goes, I was just talking to my lady about you. He goes, I went to jail and because of what you said, when I came out, I went to Delta College and went through the electrician's program and now I'm working at Apple. Nice. And so you never know when you're going to change somebody's Absolutely. life. Absolutely. And those are, the, those are the success stories that I think could be all over Stockton if we just, like you said, put that olive branch out there and reach out to these people who don't know any other way. Right. They're just making it day by day. Absolutely. We change one life at a time, and every time we change one of those lives, that's one less victim from our citizens. But, but I think it's a um, domino effect. That person changes other people's Absolutely. lives. This Absolutely. This guy's name was Fred Wesley, and my wife's a school teacher, and I wanted to take him and go do an assembly and talk to the kids and, and go to Marshall Middle School and just share with the kids or in that fishbowl and share with his success story. What could, what is possible other than crime and violence? Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what we're talking about. And, and we in law enforcement, that's what we want to do. We want to help change lives and, and, and keep our citizens safe and, and, uh, and, and get back involved in the game. So what is your message to the people? With well, my message right now would be please get out and vote. You've seen what's been going on. You know it's time for a change. And my election is over on June 5th, and absentee ballots come out here in just about a week. Okay. And uh, uh, so if you're not registered to vote, please register this time. Get involved. See what a difference you can make in your own community. And uh, um, uh, I pledge to you that we are going to turn our department around. We have great men and women that work there. We just need to give them the support they need. And uh, we, have a city, we have city councils and we have board of supervisors that are all engaged ready to make this change please get involved and vote you can make a difference so uh show up on june 5th and uh, have your voice be heard so if somebody wanted to get in contact with you how would they go about doing that you know i have my uh, uh my my uh web page which is withrow for sheriff f-o-r well withrow for sheriff dot com um i have uh facebook i'm all over facebook and twitter and all that so I'm out there, I'm easy to get hold of, and uh, um, my cell phone's listed on all that, so you can call me. And, oh, and, wow. Uh, you're, um, you're accessible. Absolutely. <laughs> call me and ask me. I'll, I'll talk to you. <laughs> Most people try to hide from, uh, from all that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're, you're willing to take the tough questions. I will. Like. I will. I mean, if you're, if you're going to invest your, your vote in me, then you should be able to know what you're getting. I like that. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen... Patrick Withrow, I'd like to extend an olive branch to anybody else's thinking about running against uh, Sheriff Moore or Withrow or anybody in that platform. Uh, I want to be fair and balanced here. Uh, again, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in, and I will see you next Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Have a great day.